I'm very happy to present Bergen Bio here to present and uh, welcome the CEO, uh, Richard Godfrey, on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ricard. Um, my name's also Richard. Richard Godfrey, CEO of Bergen Bio. Thank you to ABG for inviting me to present and represent the company here. So we're a biotech company from Bergen on the west coast of Norway. Um, we're publicly traded on the Oslo Exchange, so I should draw your attention to the usual disclaimer and forward-looking statements. So we're an oncology biotech company. Now, in spite of recent innovation and developments in the field of cancer treatment, cancer still remains the, the number one healthcare problem in the world, taking, uh, taking account for more than a third of deaths worldwide. Um, I'm really proud that Bergen Bio is pioneering the way in which we can you know, stop cancer from becoming aggressive. Aggressive cancer is ones that no longer respond to drugs, that invisible and untractable by the immune system is able to spread around our body and seed the secondary tumors. These are the really dangerous cancers and these are the cancers that kill people. So we've been working for many years, more than a decade or so, trying to understand on how the cancers survive, even though we're treating them very aggressively with chemo agents or we're turbocharging our immune system to go and hunt down and kill cancer cells, how is it that they still survive? And we've discovered this thing called Axel. It's a protein that sits on the cell surface and it mediates survival programs in the cancer cell. And today we remain at the forefront of understanding the role and function of Axel in making cancers aggressive. There's lots of science, I've tried to minimize it, but I, I want to really convey the fact that uh, we truly are the world leaders in understanding what makes cancer aggressive. Um, today we have three inhibitors of this protein called Axel in clinical development. We have a one-a-day pill called bemcentinib. We have an antibody drug called tilvestimab, and we've licensed the development of an antibody drug conjugate, which is basically an antibody and a chemo agent combined together. We've licensed that to a Swiss biotech company. We have demonstrated that our drug works when you take it on its own, when you take it in combination with chemo agents, and when you take it in combination with these new immune modulating or immune oncology agents. We're quite focused to demonstrate proof of concept in, uh, and, and, and indeed go through to market in leukemia and also in lung cancer. Although Axel inhibition holds the potential to be the cornerstone, it truly does, to be the cornerstone of cancer treatment right across the board. Patients who are unlucky enough to have a high expressor of Axel are the patients who have the worst prognosis. And by inhibiting Axel, you can change their prognosis so that they can have what might be a, a much better life expectancy. As I said, we're listed on the Oslo Boers. Uh, we have quite extensive clinical collaborations with the company that's probably the number one oncology company in the world, and that's Merck, in particular with their blockbuster drug called Keytruda, which is the number one in this immune-modulating, immune-promoting uh, drugs. Um, although we hail from Bergen, and we have a research team in Bergen, just a small team in Bergen, most of our operations take place out of Oxford in the UK. Um, and so I somehow split my life between the two centers. So what is it that we mean when we say Axel's aggressive, uh, cancer's aggressive and Axel mediates this survival program? Well, what I'm trying to explain here is this is a cancer. It's a lump that's growing somewhere in your body and it becomes inflamed. You get immune response. You even take chemo agents and you start trying to kill the cancer cells and that works to a certain degree, but invariably it comes back. And when it comes back, or it doesn't respond, it resists the drugs, it spreads around the body, and it's invisible to the immune system. What we know is when you give chemo radiation targeted agents, it promotes an immune response, and you get immune cells penetrating the tumor. They're called tumor infiltrating leukocytes. That's the, that's the warhead of the immune system, getting inside of the tumor, trying to kill the cancer cells. But cancer's really clever. It's very, very well developed. And on the cancer cell, you get these proteins sticking out on the surface that are able to mediate various responses to what's going on in the microenvironment around them. Axel's one of those, one of those proteins. What we've learned now is not only is it upregulated when this environment becomes hostile and allows the cancer cell to escape, hide from the immune system and tolerate the chemo or hypoxic environment, it also drives Axel to be present on the immune cell and switches off various parts of the immune system. So even though the immune cells can get inside, they can't do anything. They're inactive because the cancer is able to switch off and stop 
the immune response, right at the, right at the core of where cancer is dangerous. Now, we've done a lot of research over decades now to, 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 to show that. But what was really exciting is just a few weeks ago, we were able to present this data for the first time. Here we've taken a biopsy from a patient and we're able to look at the different cells inside the patient's tumour and stain them for different proteins to so we can see the different cells. And when we magnify and then use some image enhancement technologies, what we can see is there's particular elements of the immune system that become axle positive. And when they're axle positive, they're switching off and they're dampening down the immune response. This is really, really dangerous because you've, you've got the immune cells penetrating into the tumour. They should actually be clearing away the, the, the cancer cells, but they don't work. So this is a patient who you wouldn't expect to, to, to respond to, to immune-boosting drugs like Keytruda. But in that fact, this patient here saw a shrinkage of 50% of their, of their tumour for 95 weeks and is ongoing. That's quite a remarkable result and something that wouldn't be expected. And how do we do that? with a simple one-a-day pill. All the biotechnology and all the innovation goes to understanding the biology that makes cancer aggressive and then developing a drug that only inhibits Axel. If it only inhibits Axel, it doesn't really have any effect on any other proteins in the body and therefore it's well tolerated. So we have a really clean safety profile. We've now been in more than 250 <coughs> patients without any serious adverse events. And it's just a simple one-a-day pill. As I said, our showcase is in leukemia and in non-small cell lung cancer. They're the two largest hematological and solid tumours, but it's quite applicable across the board in almost every different tumour you can imagine. Just recently, a few weeks ago in actual fact, the FDA recognised the innovative nature of what we're doing and awarded us something called Fast Track. That's their way of signalling to companies like ours that they think that our drug, bemcentinib, has real potential to help patients who have no other treatment options. And what they say is, we'll give you fast track, we'll give you access to our uh, assessors, we'll give you um, advice, we'll, we'll, we'll open the doors so that we can have uh, accelerated approval and, and rapid, rapid uh, routes for these drugs can be available for patients who really don't have any other option. So we're very, very pleased to, to have that. In addition, we also received orphan designation, which gives us enhanced uh, commercialization rights and extended patent protection. So as we stand today, having worked on this drug for, for eight years or so, is we're poised to start the late stage development, which means the last round of, of, of clinical trials before we can apply for marketing authorization and hopefully start selling the drug on, on the market. So there's still a few years to go, but having understood this biology, developed the drugs that inhibit it, gone through all of the early testing, we're now poised to go for, 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 for two indications that are really, really significant, unmet needs with great potential. This is best communicated in a, in a pipeline. So here's the drug, bemcentinib. This is the indication, second-line leukemia, both as monotherapy but also in combination with chemo. Second-line lung cancer. Well, lung cancer is a massive disease treated in lots of different ways, with chemo, with these new drugs like Keytruda, and also, of course, with a combination of chemo and Keytruda. So we're testing our drug in all of those settings, and we'll be able to turn the card on all of these middle of next year. I'm going to show you some data just from that first cohort whose patients have failed on chemo, and I'll show you how well our Keytruda performs when it's combined with our drug. Of course, we're not alone. We've been working on this for a long time, so have others, but we remain in the lead by quite a long way. The way in which we should understand cancer drugs of the future are drugs that are very selective, that only stop the cancer from surviving, and not broad-spectrum chemo agents that kill every cell that they come in contact with. Maybe it's a cancer drug, may a cancer cell, maybe it's not. So our agent is highly selective for Axel. Axel's only expressed on aggressive cancers, and as I say, we're coming to the end of the phase two, about to start the phase three studies. So selectivity is important for safety. It also means that we can identify patients who have an axle positive disease. And this is where it gets really clever. We've developed some biomarkers and now some diagnostic tests. So we can identify half the patients who have got an axle positive disease. And in future, we'll only treat them and indeed, the healthcare providers will only pay for the patients who have an actual positive disease. If you give your drug to everybody, everybody gets the side effects, 
but only a small proportion gets the benefit. If you can find the patients who have got this axle-driven disease, you then give them the right drug, and hopefully a large proportion of those patients get very better very quickly, and we don't waste time, money, and of course patients' lives with drugs that won't work. So safety, biomarkers, and of course the other real value is that cancer is very challenging. So even if we can slow down its progression, we still need to add in other drugs to really clear the cancer away. And we can combine our drug very effectively with all classes of drugs so far. So we're leading with bemcentinib. The Japanese biotech company called Daiichi Sankyo have developed something that's similar, but still way behind. Genmag in Denmark have got a similar drug. And then a number of other firms have got less selective drugs. That means that they have some activity against Axel, but they have activity against many other proteins and many other side effects. So acute myeloid leukemia. Well, it's the largest adult leukemia that, that prevails. And in spite of recent innovations, the five-year survival rate for these patients is still quite pitiful, maybe five or eight percent. It really is a very, very serious disease. And it's called acute because it means that it rapidly onsets and patients get sick very, very quickly. And regrettably, they die very, very quickly. It predominantly occurs in elderly patients. And this is where we see great opportunity. We've tested our drug as a monotherapy. Patients who are very sick, they failed every other line of treatment, and they simply take our pill once a day. We've also been able to identify the subset of patients, it's just over half, who have an axle-driven disease. They're the patients that so great benefit, where we see almost, what is it, 43% complete response. That means their, tumor, their, their, their leukemia is completely gone. And the median duration of response seems a relatively short period of time. But we have to remember that this disease is an acute disease and potentially life-threatening. Patients often die within days or weeks of, at this stage when they come onto, onto our treatment. And we've also seen some patients um, surviving out to five months, and we've got some fresh data that shows even, even greater. But when we add in a low-dose chemo, this is called low-dose RSC, it's an old-fashioned chemo that's been used for a long time, and it's used in very low dose in these patients, we see that we get a similar complete response rate but the duration now is exceeding eight months. This becomes really very, very, very useful for these patients who otherwise don't have any treatment option. Indeed, just as an aside, um, about four years ago now, I met one of the first patients who came onto this trial, which is, which is quite unusual as a sponsor of a clinical trial. And he was a charming man in his late 70s who really had resided himself to the fact that he had a serious disease and was going to die. He started taking our medicines and said, anything that I can do to help. The last I heard, he was going on a cruise with his grandchildren, and the doctor was concerned that he wasn't coming in for his appointments. That's, that, that still gives me bumps on the back of my head. I'm, I'm a pharmacist. I've been developing new drugs for 35 years, and to actually have met that person and have these stories is really quite, quite remarkable. So lung cancer, by contrast, is a huge, huge disease. More than 2 million patients a year. Um, and still, in spite of recent innovation, this five-year survival rate in the vast majority of patients is very, very low indeed. We still haven't cured lung cancer. It's, it's a very serious disease indeed. And, of course, it's a gigantic market. I mean, it's, it's, it's somewhere in the region of 16 billion a year just for treating lung cancer, poised to go to 24 billion, and a lot of that is driven by these immune oncology drugs such as Keytruda. Indeed, I think Gertrude is currently earning Merck about a billion dollars a month. <laughs> so how do we treat lung cancer? Well, in just the same way as I said, we find the biomarkers that drive the disease, and then we see if we can find drugs that target patients with those biomarkers. What we know is all of these, no matter what, what the driver and what the drug, all of these have a limited su survival benefit somewhere between zero and maybe a year, after which the patients progress, the tumour starts to grow. The tumour gets used to the drug and can live in that environment. So this second line opportunity is the real unmet need. And this is where our trials are positioned now. We, we add our drug to the immune checkpoint inhibitor called Keytruda, and we're seeing quite remarkable results. I won't go into too much detail with the results, other than to say this is a survival plot with time along the bottom and obviously the patients. The median point is the 50%, when half the patients have progressed. And what we can see is patients who do not have an axle-driven disease 
have a medium progression free survival of just three months. That's all that happens. They take the drug, nothing really happens for a few months, and then the tumor starts to grow back again. When we add our drug, Keytruda, it moved out to 8.4 months, nearly threefold extension in progression free survival. Now, that's a really important measure for patients. How long am I going to stay well? How long is it going to be before my cancer comes back? Progression free survival. But what's really important, of course, for the cancer patients is overall survival. How long am I going to live? I know I've got cancer. Median overall survival number is the one that's really important. And I can tell you here and now, we haven't got to that point. Half of our patients haven't died yet. So that's good news. The longer that time lapse is, the better the news. If we can compare that to other drugs that are also being tested in this space, in particular Keytruda, what we see is that they're all around this three, four, five month time point. Nowhere near this eight month uh, time point for PFS. So we see a threefold improvement in patients that we can identify with our biomarker, and that's more than half the patients, and four times what might be expected for Keytruda on its own. So we've got a large focus on bemcentinib, the one a day axle inhibitor. We're also developing an antibody against the same target, and that's because there are many other diseases that are also mediated by axle, and we wouldn't want our drug to be used in all those other indications and see some what they call sort of economic contamination, being the price of the drug being fall to the lowest possible denominator. So we're developing other drugs in the space as well. And as I mentioned before, we've also partnered to develop uh, development of an antibody drug conjugate, and that's under somebody else's sponsorship. As a business such as ours, we don't have any revenue of note. Our revenue is really clinical it's data, clinical science, and our profit is good results. So we have to think of it in those terms. We are, of course, contingent on equity to, to, to raise money and to fund, fund the organization. And probably one of the more important aspects of my role is, is, is to ensure good custody of our cash as well as the operations of the business. And we can see fairly constant uh, profit over, over recent quarters and fairly constant reporting. And of course, it's very important for investors to know that the vast majority of the investment is going into R&D and not into admin and overhead. So we always try and disclose that. So maintaining a cash flow so that we can continue operations is critical. We had a small capital raise earlier in the year, and we finished quarter three with nearly 300 million kroner, or $32 million in our account, which is about the equivalent of four or five months of, of cash burn. So don't just take my word for it. We can also reference analysts who are extremely inf well informed and learned in the space. We have two analysts in the US who cover us from H.C. Wainwright and Jones Trading, and also the Scandinavian banks, including uh, ABG Sandal, also cover us as well. So you have access to that to that that analyst cover. And from our website, we also sponsor some some analyst coverage as well, so that you can you can see that at the same time. Of course, keeping everyone informed is critical, and it's um, with great pleasure that we come to the end of 2019, and I'm able to confirm that every single significant medical congress in leukemia and lung cancer, we've had high profile presentations back in June, July, September, October, November, and even this weekend at the American Society of Hematology, we're presenting some updates on our leukemia study. So a very, very active presentation. At SITSI a few weeks ago, we had a very high profile presentation, one of the plenary presentations in front of maybe 3,000 people in, in what was almost like a, like a, like a soccer pits uh, auditorium because our data and those images that I showed you earlier is, is so fundamental to what makes cancer aggressive. So with that, I'll uh, close. Thank you for your attention and open for any questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Richard. So I will be holding the Q&A uh, session for now. Uh, so first of all, you uh, pursue a companion diagnostics uh, path, uh, obviously with the biomarkers. Can you say anything about how that usually impacts success rates mm. going from phase one to uh, an actual marketed yeah, product? Sure. No, great question. And the answer, of course, is, is significant. Mm. Phase one is the safety study, and it's not really relevant to, look, look to select patients there based on biomarkers. But uh, as we go through phase two and phase three, there's a significant improvement. In fact, I think it's a threefold improvement from, what, from 
two to three, and I think it's a fourfold from three to four in terms of success in, 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 in clearing the market. Mm. Of course, you have to remember that's developing two different, diff different yeah. products. Mm. So whilst they're, they're linked, they're two different products. So it does require two different development programs, but the, the, the benefit is, is, uh, is both in success in clearing the regulatory hurdles, but also in reimbursement. Mm. Typically, you can anticipate 25 to 40% higher reimbursement, quite simply because we're not wasting our drug on the patients who don't have an actual actual driven disease. Mm. Yeah, so reimbursement from the insurance companies and, yes. and such. Yeah. Uh, so looking at the data you presented from the non-small cell lung can cancer, sort of the phase A uh, part there, mm -hmm. um, obviously you showed very strong data, but the patients were not pre-treated with uh, K-True, that is checkpoint inhibitor, but you have that data coming up. Yep. Do you believe that that data will be even more important to look, that look at, and can we expect similar uh, efficacy uh, outcome in terms of uh, response rate and, and the duration of response, for example? Or do you believe we should uh, set the threshold a bit lower when uh, analyzing that upcoming uh, expect yes. expectations? There, so. so what we're talking about is obviously treating patients who are particularly at this end of the spectrum who previously were not eligible to a checkpoint inhibitor because they, they don't have the biomarker for the checkpoint inhibitor. So they just received chemo, they failed, they really don't have any treatment options left, so they were taking Keytruda. And I think the important thing to remember, and I didn't have time to disclose it, is that 55% of the patients in our study were PDL1 negative, and another 22% were PDL1 10%. So it's really the patients who you wouldn't expect to respond to Keytruda. And we've, uh, we're able to turn that response around. I can overlay this with a PDL1 high, and it's almost exactly the same. Mm. These are the patients with the best with the best outcome. These are the patients up here who maybe have something like a 45% response rate to Keytruda. Mm. So your question is, should we expect that when, when patients have failed on Keytruda, mm and they're re-challenged with it and they take our drug, mm. will Keytruda work? Well, of course, that's the, that's the panacea. That's yeah. what Merck would love. Mm. Yeah. Merck is treating the vast majority of these patients with Keytruda. Mm. It works anywhere between zero and maybe 12 months, and then the patients fail. Merck wants to know, how can we make these patients benefit longer for our drug? Mm. And of course, we think we have some of the answers because it's based on why are the immune system, why is the immune system not working? And it's because of the actual positive macrophages. So these, these trials in these other cohorts are, are ongoing, as we mentioned here, IO refractory, IO chemo refractory. We're reporting out during the first half of next year to, um, to give you some steer on it. We, we have high level of confidence, high level of confidence that we're going to see equally interesting and exciting data. Perfect. Uh, just a um, finishing question. Could you give us some uh, information on, on your background, what you found interesting with Virgin Bio, yep. and, and perhaps even uh, give us a bit of your vision for the future mm -hmm. as well for the company? Yeah, great. Thank you. So thanks for the opportunity. So I think I mentioned earlier I'm a pharmacist. I've been in the industry for 30 years. Um, um, started life as a scientist, sort of moved through various roles in big and small pharmaceutical companies, um, Originally from the UK, I was in Switzerland for a while, then out to the States, and then family decision. My wife is from Bergen, QED. Um, happy wife, happy life. Yeah. Um, moved to Bergen, and that's when I met Jim Lorenz, our scientific founder. Um, he, um, he's an American. He, he also ended up in Bergen. He's an academic researcher, and he was asking that really hard question. Why is it that when we treat cancer, invariably it comes back, and when it comes back, it doesn't respond to drugs? And it, that led him to this thing called Axel. And of course, once you saw it, he kept finding it and kept finding it and kept finding it. So I met Jim about 11 years ago. It was really interesting. He's a, he's a charismatic scientist. I said, this is really important. By inhibiting Axel, we're not killing the cancer cells. What we're doing is we're stopping them from surviving. And it's subtle differences that make all the, all the difference. This is what's going on in here. Okay? The immune system clears it but Axel actually stops the immune system from working. So you can see I'm still excited about it because this is really fundamental. This is what actually makes cancer aggressive. So where you often see and hear in the media that you know, cancer is going to become a chronic condition and we're going to be treating it with one drug and then another drug and then another drug in the same way as we live with AIDS, you know, I truly believe that's going to be the case for, for cancer. And my grandchildren are going to say, what was the big deal? And the big deal was the fact that we understand now how cancer survives. And being able to stop that 
we've got a good chance of being able to treat it and clear it as, as it gets smarter and smarter. Because this is fundamental. There's lots of questions you could ask me about, is Axel ever mutated? Are we ever seeing different forms where the drug won't work? And we don't now because we're addressing the fundamental mechanism. This isn't, this isn't something that's switched on by cancers to, 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 to avoid a drug. This is a basic survival program. In fact, if we have a minute, this is also the same survival program that viruses use to survive as well. So Ebola and Zika viruses, two of the highest profile at the moment, we, uh, we, we, in fact, um, during the um, Ebola outbreak on the west coast of Africa four or five years ago, the World Health Organization, the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation scoured the world looking at for, for agents that were effective. They shortlisted three to, to be tested in a level five containment uh, suite to, to see if they could treat it. Ours is one of those three, and it worked very well. As we know, they've now developed a vaccine against Ebola. Guess what? It doesn't work. We're seeing the outbreaks right now. It doesn't work for the same reason. The vaccine targets the T cells to go in and kill the, the Ebola virus, but Ebola uses axle and uh, interferon gamma as a way of avoiding it. So what's this space? It's yeah, really exciting yeah. biology. And that's because it's fundamental to the way in which alien cells survive inside our body, whether it's a viral infected cell or it's a cancer cell, or indeed maybe it's fibrosis, scleroderma, COPD, all of these diseases that are well, sometimes we've got autoimmune or immune evasive. It's because of this. Perfect. Thank very you, good. Richard. Thank uh, you very uh, much indeed. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.